Okay, well, so much for the intro music. Um, good evening, Lang. Good evening, everyone. This is Wayne Parker with a pause for thought here on Baton Rouge Community Radio, 96.9 FM here in Baton Rouge. We apologize for the technical difficulties, but our engineer was having a bit of a problem, apparently. Anyway, we're glad to have you here. Lang Baker is with me as usual. Lang, good evening. Howdy, Wayne. And I'd like to encourage everyone listening to listen and call in and share your thoughts on the topic of the evening. 343-9927. 343-9927 is the number to call on tonight's topic. Um, and I forget why I got interested in this topic, Lang, but I thought of, tonight's topic anyway is um, Russian involvement in the in the on the African continent, I began just wondering about that some time back. Uh, we've done a couple of shows, one on American troop involvement in on the African continent in various African countries, and we uh, have also talked about the China One Belt One Road Initiative, which you know, and China's extensive involvement in the African continent. And so I thought we'd look into what Russia's doing there and. Not surprisingly, I found that historically, um, at least, well, we know, we know from talking about the Middle East and Persia and uh, the European countries' competition for control of the Ottoman Empire or those parts of the world there around the Mediterranean and northern Africa, that Russia was a major player at the time. And then after the formation of the Soviet Union, of course, they were the Soviets were all over the African continent, uh, fomenting discontent against the colonial powers and everything else, taking advantage of the ill will created by Western countries there, you know, and and inserting themselves to influence the region and and gain uh, footholds there. And of course, after communism collapsed, they left. But now, from what I see, they are going back into Africa, great guns so to speak. No pun intended, but there is a pun there. Um, so what are they doing, Lang? Well, uh, I started off looking at a number of different articles that have come out earlier this year describing uh, trips that have been made by their ministers to African nations and their, them receiving dignitaries and representatives from African countries in Moscow and it sounds like there, there are two tracks. There's the economic side of it, and then there's the military aid side of it. Yeah, and there's also political um, influence peddling, number one, to, to fan discontent against the current powers that are there, i.e. America and China, and also to gain support in the U.N. for Russian policies. And in exchange, they support African countries um, in the UN to you know protecting them against sanctions and whatnot for some of their tyrannical governments and whatnot. Yeah, and and they are able to supply arms when when uh, in some cases it's it's cheaper to get Russian arms. Well, plus and also go ahead. Russia doesn't put the conditions on them or block them because of issues regarding uh, human rights or. And one of the things I saw in one of the articles I have here is um, one of the reasons African com countries are starting to shy away from the United States and the European countries, which have been their traditional allies, really. Um, this one article here, I think it was Council on Foreign Relations, where they state that um, the election of Donald Trump and Brexit have created concerns in the African countries about the stabilities and the um, reliability of the Western countries to help them. And so they are naturally turning their focus away from them and toward Russia. And you said something at the beginning of the show about um, the U.S. is intending to cut way back on funding for involvement in Africa. Well, there was, there was one, uh, I believe it was a Brookings Institute report that was primarily about Russia's activities there, but at the end it mentioned that the Pentagon has said that in the next three years it expects to reduce special operations forces in Africa ah, okay. um, by up to 50 percent. Yes, and I saw something here just, just while we were talking before the show where um, 
Donald Trump's recent, recently proposed budget plans on cutting all aid to the African continent by 30 percent. So that's going to be a major reduction there, too. And, of course, just as China has attempted to fill the void where we've withdrawn, the Western nations have withdrawn elsewhere in the world, Russia's jumping in there and trying to replace us. Yeah, and then there's also on the other side of it, one of the reports I was reading was talking about how uh, African Union or spokesmen, spokespersons for uh, some of the nations there are not so much turning away as trying to in attract a greater variety of outside sources so there's more competition, they can get a better deal. And that was a standard trade, I guess, during the Cold War. I know that uh, Nasser, Abdel Nasser of Egypt, well, all the countries did that, Iran and all, they, they played the Western countries against the Soviet Union and took advantage of the opportunities with that, like talking to yeah. two different car dealers at the same time and going between them. Yeah. And there, another angle on this is uh, there, there's quite a bit that I came across about what Russia is doing and proposing to do and in, in making uh, economic agreements and, and uh, military aid agreements. But then there was another piece that was saying, well, Russia is kind of behind behind the uh, the trends here because they've just recently proposed having their first uh, Africa presentation where they want all the leaders from all the African Union nations, 55 nations in Africa, to come for working out these deals, kind of like a trade conference or something. Right. And China has been doing this since, I think they said 2000, and the European Union has been doing it for several years, and Russia had been talking about doing it for several years, but they haven't. Now they've come out an announcement where they're probably going to do it next year, but they still haven't actually held it. Right. And, um, of course, we know that Russia was crippled for a long time, you know, economically because of the collapse of the Soviet Union and everything else. But... Um, they do have a huge presence there, from what I've read, of troops in the so-called peacekeeping missions. Uh, I've read several places where the total number of Russian troops over there in that performing that function, ostensibly, exceeds the number of French, British, and United States troops combined. So they've they've got a large military presence there um, well, under the UN auspices. Yeah, under the UN, and then they also have. Uh, in agreements with individual nations for providing uh, military gear and also military personnel and civilian personnel to train them in the use of the uh, gear. And then there's also uh, several references to use of a, like a private military force called the Wagner Group or the Wagner, Wagner, Wagner yeah. Group or Wagner, Wagner yeah. Group, yeah. Which uh, is all, from from what I was reading, that that is the group of so-called Russian mercenaries that were involved in the firefight with U.S. troops in Syria where, where some Russians were killed. Right. And that was supposed to be troops from the Wagner Group. And then they've also... We weren't told that here, though. Well, that's that's what I've read yeah, recently. Oh, no, I, I understand. And so also... Uh, they identified Wagner troops working in Yemen where the civil war is going on now. And then most recently was in the Central African Republic where uh, there were three independent journalists from Russians that were sent in by a uh, Russian oligarch who had a falling out with the Kremlin and, and is in exile now and is is funding this private investigative journalist operation. And these three journalists went down there to look at the the Russians that were on the ground to help with military activity or training in CAR and with the suspicion that these were Wagner people as well. Uh, and the three journalists were killed, murdered while they were down there. Murdered, and So yeah. there's... there's uh, question about who was responsible for that murder, those murders. Right. But CAR is, in, from what I was reading, it's like uh, seven or eight or more different 
warring factions within the country. So it's it's like a full-blown multiplayer civil war going on there. Lots of opportunities for exercising influence, developing influential allies in the on the continent, and also selling weapons. Yeah, and also mineral resources here that uh, supposedly the site that these re- these reporters were going to involved, I think it was a gold mine operation in CAR. Uh, and so there are that's one of Russia's interest in, in the economic sphere is getting various Russian uh, large-scale companies operating mining operations in oil and gas operations and infrastructure construction. There was one article from back in 2008 that named a half a dozen or so of these companies, and, and they pretty much were tied with various named oligarchs, some of whom uh, have alleged ties with the Russian mafia and some of whom are uh, former KGB people. And like Putin. And yeah, it sounded like it's pretty much his circle. Uh, yeah, and like we were saying before uh, the show, you, ha- you had found articles about these companies having been involved um, a good ways back, I guess. And I'm wondering that they are state-owned or partially state-owned or government-owned companies, or they were, and now they're run by oligarchs. And, of course, when communism collapsed, um, a lot of the Russian state-owned businesses were sold off to oligarchs. And some of the companies you mentioned here that are involved uh, in on the African continent are listed in an, another article that I have called, it's from the uh, Institute for Strategic Studies Today. It's an article, ISS Today, Russia and Africa Meet Again, and they list um, Gazprom, of course, Luke Oil, Rostec, and Rosatom that have investments or interest in Algeria, Egypt, South Africa, Uganda, and Angola. And... Another, there's an article here from Council on Foreign Relations, Putin's Russia and Africa, that states that between 2000 and 2012, Russia's trade with Africa increased 10 times over. And one of these articles, other articles I have here says that um, I think up between 2005 and 2015, it in, their trade with Africa increased 187%. I don't know if those two numbers correlate, but and of course, like we we realize that Russia's way behind China and America, but you know, so that gives them a lot more room to grow. But with America withdrawing, so to speak, uh, and by the way, that thirty percent reduction in the federal budget for Africa was for humanitarian aid. That's what Trump's cutting is, to, you know, taking care of people ostensibly, you know. But I did want to mention specifically here this article from the Council on Foreign Relations also states that Russia has invested heavily in raw resource mega projects signing a four billion dollar deal with uganda in february of this year to build and operate a crude oil refinery and a three billion dollar deal with zimbabwe to develop a platinum mine and you had mentioned something about cobalt uh, earlier before the show too but before we go on with that uh, i wanted to remind listeners you're listening to wayne parker and lang baker here with a pause for thought here on Baton Rouge Community Radio, uh, it's a live call-in show. We're talking about Russian involvement in the African continent. Give us a call, 343-9927, 343-9927, and tell us what you're thinking. Well, the cobalt thing was, was China instead of Russia, but it, it came across. I was watching a France 24 English language program the other day with an investigative reporter who had gone to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is one of the countries that uh, Russia uh, earlier this year, the foreign minister, visited uh, in, in an effort to, to uh, reach some, some economic and military aid uh, agreements with the Democratic Republic of Congo. But this reporter had gone, well, she, she was discussing a var- variety of things. The program wasn't focused on this, but one of the things she mentioned was a number of years ago, she had gone to the Congo to look at some cobalt mines uh, because of uh, the use of child labor in, right. in these mines. But when she tried to go back just recently, they wouldn't let her go to the mines, and she was prevented from going. But the strategic significance of cobalt that she was describing is that it's it's uh, used in in uh, manufacture of batteries, which are used all the way from cell phones up to electric cars 
and she was saying that China's the one that's gotten in there and has okay has has a lock hold on on uh, that right now, which uh, she said they have it locked up for like I think she said for the next six to eight years or something like that. Okay, you could have stopped right when you corrected me that it was China and not Russia, but that's okay. Well, it, it it illustrates the competition between these two countries. Yes, of course, that's relevant. Yes, countries that are going on in the Democratic Republic of Congo as well as elsewhere because. Uh, like I say, it was back in I think March of this year when when uh, the Russian foreign minister made a, a trip around visiting five different countries down in Africa to yeah. try to wrap up military deals with them. And well, military deals, deals plus diplomatic and deals and economic aid yeah. and what other investment. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, these are big things. And one of the things I mentioned. There's another article here about um, the waning influence of the United States. Uh, George Bush, apparently, one of his programs concerning AIDS was credited with saving 12 million lives on the continent. And I'm sure that was a big thing. But uh, according to this other article I read, uh, Barack Obama kind of tapered off of aid to Africa. And African exports to the U.S. have dropped by $8 million, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, I guess. But, uh, you know, they're, they're an up-and-coming continent to begin with anyway. But one of the things that uh, gives Russia an advantage over us, I guess, is that they don't, they're not hampered so much by um, moral concerns or ethical concerns, probably because their public doesn't know, they know, our public knows even less about what they're doing than our public does, what our government is doing. But, um, you know, we, we try, our government supposedly puts a lot of moral restrictions on how things can be used, you know, things that we sell them. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking of the um, weapons that Saudi Arabia are using in Yemen, but that they're, we are selling them. But anyway, right. um, there was uh, an instance, oh, let's see, back in 2014, it says, and this is the Council on Foreign Relations article again, uh, when the United States rejected a Nigerian request for Cobra attack helicopters in 2014, Nigeria responded by canceling a U.S. military training program to fight Boko Haram and invested in Russian aircraft. Uh, and, that, and now Russia trains Nigerian special forces. So America was kicked out of Nigeria, and, um, and Russia has stepped into that vacuum. And it seems to be the pattern lately. Um, I think Tom Daschle's quoted in one of these articles as saying that the Trump administration is asleep at the wheel. But, you know, I think Barack Obama was um, equally um, negligent in that regard. Yeah, there, there's a lot uh, played off against each other. And the Security Council is one place where that plays out, as you mentioned earlier, about part of the, of the deal is where the Russians will veto sanctions against the some of the African nations, and then the African nations will vote along with Russia, and then the Russia will sell them weapons and send trainers in. And yeah, well, that's true. No, another thing is countries that America is forbidden, American companies are forbidden to deal with in Africa, or countries that we're not allowed to sell arms to, Russia's filling that void too. Uh, and I wanted to correct myself here. This article I was thinking about, about the decline in African exports was $8 billion a year. They decreased by $8 billion in 2015, according to U.S. Census data. So, Yeah, one of the, one of the articles I was reading, and one thing they mentioned in there is that China is now the number one uh, exporter into Africa at about twice the level of the number two country, which is the U.S. I don't remember right. what the numbers were. but And, and Russia's uh, way behind, like we said, but it's, it's, it's really working hard to catch up. And of course, they're saying all the experts or so-called experts that I've read in these articles are all saying that it's kind of iffy because Russia's kind of in, a, in an economic bind right now. But the um, sanctions against Russia as a result of their, you know, taking over the Crimea, I think it was. That was, yeah, the Crimea and, and the uh, their incursion in or supporting the, yeah. the fighting going on in the Ukraine. But because of those things, they, they've, they've refocused on Africa also economically. Yeah, well, that was the basis for some of the sanctions and some of the entities and persons that were sanctioned or these companies, that the Russian companies that do a lot of mining and, and uh, oil 
infrastructure that we were talking about earlier, those are the targets of a lot of these sanctions. And then the, the uh, primary actors within those companies. Yeah, something else that uh, Russia is doing is providing scholarships for citizens in the developing world in general, which of course includes the African continent, and they've recently begun allowing visa-free access for South Africans to come there. Wasn't it the African countries that were invited to observe the war games that Russia is conducting right now? I don't know. And I don't, I'm not sure. I may be, me, uh, I may be uh, remembering that incorrectly, but uh, but you know that that reminds me. You know, with, with Russia getting involved with universities and schooling and all that, providing scholarships and whatnot, that's kind of what they were doing when they were the Soviet Union. And one of the advantages I think they've always had over us was lamented by Eleanor Roosevelt uh, in her autobiography. I just finished reading that a few months ago. And she had been to Russia a couple of times under Khrushchev, and she said that one of the difficulties and her disappointments in America was that we weren't doing anything to to teach our people about the rest of the world and other cultures and how important it was to engage these cultures, whereas the Soviet Union at the time, and I guess Russia now, they're aware of that benefit and they, having more power over their citizenry, far more than the U.S. government does, they are able to influence and educate their citizens about number one serving the motherland and number two engaging in these other countries and they were apparently according to her anyway they were providing much more humanitarian aid and educational services schools and whatnot than the west was back um, in the 40s and so that we're reading this here that they're getting involved in that again um, is significant because I don't think the U.S. is doing anything like that. I'm not aware of it. Okay, um, you're listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Baker here on Baton Rouge Community Radio. This is the Pause for Thought. Um, we've got about six minutes left in the show. We're talking about Russian involvement on the African continent. 343-9927 is the number to call. 343-9927 if you have questions, comments, objections. Anything, if you'd like to add it, we'd appreciate hearing from you. 343-9927. Oh, let's see. I mentioned the amount of peacekeeping troops Russia has. They're beating us out there. I was surprised to learn that Russia is the second largest arms distributor, and that um, behind us, of course. And um, I know that, you know, the AK-47 has been more popular than the, a, uh, though the M-16 around the world for a long time, a much simpler weapon and, uh, you know, less, less prone to problems and all that. I think that that's uh, one of the attractions for Russian helicopters being sold in these countries is that they're, they're uh, cost less and easier to maintain, and Russia has established uh, three stations in Africa, according to one source, for repairing uh, the helicopters, and in fact, uh, a lot of the UN helicopters used in Africa are from Ru bought from Russia. They're Russian made. So, yeah, so Russia's buying. I mean, the UN is buying Russian war material, and the African countries are buying it. You know, so um, I guess that's a problem for us. But it's an indication that tr that Russia is making inroads, and um, hopefully, it's causing somebody in our government concern. It certainly isn't causing the administration any but um, oh let's see here I'm running so out. when when uh, the Russian foreign minister was making his tour back earlier this year uh, through five Russian countries he ended his tour in Ethiopia at Addis Ababa for uh, an address to the meeting of the African Union mm -hmm. and it just so happened that our Secretary of State at the time, Rex Tillerson, was also in town to address them. Uh, but it was mentioned that uh, there's no reporting that the two ever saw each other while they were there or spoke to each other, even though they were staying in the same hotel. Yeah, I've read about um, Lavrov's visit relatively recently, um, and there's a report here from the Strategic Studies Institute, 
which is from the Army War College, that talks about in 2009, then-President Dmitry Medvedev, along with a delegation of 300 businessmen, took a highly publicized tour of Nigeria, Angolia, and Namibia, Namibia to promote Russian uh, businesses and you know alliances and whatnot. So they've been uh, in the, they've getting in, been getting involved in that stuff there too. Um, political initiatives included with South Africa in particular a treaty of friendship and cooperation covering joint work in health care and intellectual property rights. Um, I didn't think that Russia would bother with intellectual property rights, but you know, I, I guess African countries being a growing economic power. Um, yeah, well, South Africa. They're, they're, those things are important to growth. South Africa is one one of the BRICS countries, uh, which Russia is. It's yeah, Brazil and Russia and uh, India, China and South Africa. And some of the some of the uh, commentators that I was reading are, are talking about a desire for a unified BRICS engagement with Africa in terms of uh, economic deals and economic development. Right. And, and not br- just Russia by itself. Right. And so there's a natural link there between Russia and South Africa as two of the members of the BRICS group. Right. And BRICS is uh, the, the acronym for uh, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. In South Africa. And, the okay, S, the, X, the, S, the S, S is South Africa now. Okay. Right. I thought I thought it was one time I thought it was BRICS as plural, but now South Africa has been lumped in there too. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, uh, yes, and something else to mention, too, that is giving Russia uh, a big advantage as America cuts its funding in on the African continent is that uh, the African continent is expected to provide the bulk of population growth in the near future. And, you know, they are an up-and-coming and, you know, gradually at least prospering continent of nations with a lot of natural resources and the last thing we should be doing is withdrawing from it, contrary to what I was saying back when we were criticizing our troops being there. But um, Russia seems to be trying to take advantage of that. And that's something I mentioned before the show. we got a little bit of time left here. Um, you know, you and I, at least, you know, when we talked about our, our troops being all over the African continent, I was kind of bothered by that. I, I, I'm, I was against it. But here again... This is the age-old thing of the, the major powers in the world competing for resources and control. And if we aren't there doing those things, then Russia, China, and other powers are going to be doing it instead. And we're going to lose out in a very real sense. So it kind of, you know, that's like the Iraq war. That was about oil. But we needed oil, and we, we want to have control of oil. Otherwise, our enemies will control it. Yeah, I, I suppose the question is how you balance trying to move the world towards a more just regime of shared governments, governance, yeah. and and how you deal with the real reality that you're facing in, in in the current situation, and how do you devise a, a path to move from how it's structured now to how it could be structured in a in a more humane yeah. way that brings justice to a larger segment of our species. Yeah, and I guess the way I view all of that in all aspects of, you know, global politics and as well as my own life and and here in, you know, in the United States, you need to keep up the fight even if you're only holding the line because if you give up the fight and give up trying to do the right thing, the bad guys are going to win hands down, you know, and quick. So, you know, even if we're just holding the line, maybe that's the best that the good side can ever do or hope for. Anyway, we got to go, Lang. Um, I wish you could have responded to that. But anyway, we got to go. You've been listening to Wayne Parker and Lang Baker here on a pause for thought. Baton Rouge Community Radio, 96.9 FM here in Baton Rouge. We got to go. We thank you for listening. You have a good night.